there's a real dissonance between needing to garner support and remaining honest uh, in the sense of not misrepresenting your beliefs, motivations and outcomes. Do you have to lie or at least misrepresent things to be a politician and to maintain votes? Because, you know, sometimes you're put in that position. It's a really good question and I don't take it lightly. I really tried to avoid lying. I really did. And I really tried to, if I felt I couldn't answer something properly or that it was too sensitive, and that does happen in politics, particularly at a senior level on, you know, some really sensitive stuff, to be honest and say, well, look, I just can't tell you at this point in time. Um, I... Um, I found some of the people that I worked with to be very honest. You mentioned Kim Beasley a moment ago. I think Kim Beasley's a very honest man. Uh, I think he's a very fine Australian. I certainly think some of the, the same of many of the senior people I served with. Um, I, I, I think of John Howard and Peter Costello, the fundamentally straightforward people who told you what they thought, even when they had to argue a tough case. I think of people like Senator Ron Boswell from your home state, I've never met a bigger hearted and truer foe than, than Ron Boswell. It's just that, and look, you know, that's important at that level, but I'm also thinking at the, at the level of, so you, you know, you're meeting constituents, you're out there, you're knocking on doors, you're, you're talking at the local uh, Lions Club or, or whatever it is, but especially those one-on-one -on -one things where someone comes to your office and says, sir, you know, I have a, um, uh, I have an issue that you, you you need you need me to I need you to help with or I want to seeking some sort of guidance, like and I suppose specifically what I'm thinking of is something that you were talking about at ARC is like so someone comes to you with a problem that's fundamentally not something that could or should be solved by the government that a person has the capacity to solve individually or through one of the other subsidiary organisations like some sort of religious group or just a group of friends or family or something like that. But how do you politely say, well, actually, mate, go do it yourself? <laughs> That's a really good question. It opens up an enormous area, Matt. Uh, this this might surprise those of you who followed ARC, uh, but I, I actually, uh, I was on the organising committee right from day one, but I did say, look, please find experts. I'm not, I'm not some giant intellect. I'm just a, a boy from the bush who's always been interested in ideas and has knocked around in politics. Uh, and so they, uh, they rewarded me when I said, find real experts and said, how about you give a talk on subsidiarity? I said, I can't even say that. What does it mean? <laughs> uh, anyway, of course, subsidiarity is actually a really important concept. It's good and true. Um, it's uh, tested since time immemorial. It really had its genesis in uh, the old Jewish scriptures when, um, you know, the, the Israelites escaped from, um, from uh, Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Uh, and... The idea emerged that people should do for themselves that which they can do better than anybody else. And in their families and small groups and local communities, they should do for one another what they can do better at that level instead of pushing it up. So in a way, it's about accepting responsibility. Yep. It's about saying... I don't need to push this up. This is really my responsibility to sort out. Or Jimmy's got a problem. We shouldn't be expecting Canberra to solve it. We can better help him here in his own local community. And I think it's partly relational and it's partly organisational. You don't want to push everything to the top. And, and, and of course, because this idea of subsidiarity, see, I can say it now. <laughs> I kid you not. I had trouble getting my, my tongue around it for a while. Subsidiarity. Yeah, well, I, well, I only just got you to. I only just taught you to say can. So don't go hard on yourself, John. Like it's. A, it's a <laughs> uh, but but I did give that talk, and if people are interested in it, um, you know, I think it's a good one. I used the illustration from a famous uh, Dutch prime minister of about 120 years ago, Abraham Kuyper, and he said that government is like a stick that a plant can use as support to grow around the plant society. The stick's there to help the plant flourish, but the stick's not there for the stick's sake. The stick is there just to do the things that the plant can't do for itself. There are things we can't do for ourselves. We can't run a, a defence force for ourselves. Yeah. We can't run, frankly, a justice system. That should be done you know, by the community at large. Uh, we shouldn't take the law into our own hands. Um, 
uh, that, you know, when when people fall on really tough luck, we, uh, we we accept that we've got to do a helping hand collectively. But on the other hand, because you hit on a good point, it was getting bad in my day, and I think it's got a lot worse now. Uh, I always hate sounding critical of people, but too many people now, when they've got a problem, they will go and see their their federal member, and they'll outline their problem, and then the answer always starts with the government's got it, yeah. and very often. Government will only make it worse if they get involved. Mm. I had it, I, you know, that used to happen quite often. And this will surprise you as well. My wife and I, before I went into Parliament as only a young bloke, we got talked into doing a personal counselling course. And I found that invaluable because it taught me not so much to try and be prescriptive and solve people's problems if they were presenting something that they should sort out for themselves, but to ask those gentle questions. Have you thought about what does this mean? Why do you say that? What do you think the best answer might be? And very often people would then, you know, start to work it through for themselves. Yeah, exactly. And so that's the technique that um, what I'm hearing is that's the technique that you used. So when people would come to you and stuff like that. And I empathize with that actually, because I was the officer in charge of a, a place called Cohen in Cape York, um, town of about 380 souls. Uh, the police district is the size of Switzerland, actually. Um, but uh, you'd get a lot of people, like as, as an officer, and, and, and I should make another quick contextual uh, observation, that we were really the only dispute resolution service there, with the exception of a community justice group, which was a good and active group of people. But there was no other government. There's really no other government presence there. There wasn't even a local government. Uh, they, were in, they were in Cooktown. So... Anything, almost everything, came to us, and yeah. um, it wasn't just the fact that I was I was solving you know neighbourhood disputes and stuff like that, which arguably the police kind of like at least have a role in hearing and and, and understanding, not solving. Um, but what I would do was point out, and because it was predominantly indigenous too, it was basically an indigenous community uh, in, in all but definition. I'd point out that look, okay, if you lump this responsibility on me and you make me responsible for solving this problem, I'm going to need power and authority. I'm going to take power and authority off you. You must, by nature of this, you have to defer to me. That's a very powerful point, isn't it? If you, see, this is the thing. If you don't accept responsibility for yourself, you demand somebody else does it. Over time, human nature being what it is, there'll be people who'll take advantage of that mm. and won't look to your best interests. Mm. They'll look to use your situation for their own advancement. You know, there's the practical reality as well, of course. I touched on that a moment ago. It is right that some things be pushed up because you can't resolve it. And the old uh, the old uh, testament model there was that if you cannot resolve a dispute, you go to the next level. And if it can't be resolved there, yeah, ultimately you take it all the way up to the, the bloke at the top, I suppose, in our language, that would be the Prime Minister. But the Prime Minister needs to be clear to do the really big things and not be cluttered so that you can't do the big things that are really important. You know, that, that in loose terms, that would be, in my view, defence, um, running the economy, running trade, those sorts of things. Uh, if, if they're cluttered up all the time with decisions that shouldn't be theirs, that's why we ought to make our three tiers of government work properly. Matt, I think that's really important. And, and, and you've just highlighted, I've often wondered just what it's like in really remote communities. I mean, I live in a small community. Uh, and it's reasonably well organised and we're not all that far, not the way you would have been from bigger centres. Uh, but um, we really do need to revitalise our understanding that we have local government for local affairs. It's the level that's closest to the people, should help resolve as many local problems as possible. You have state for the things it's responsible for, the schools, medical services, whatever. And, and then you have the federal government. The federal government was set up by the states and it was given the powers that, the, you know, really that it was about defence, uh, probably justice, probably international affairs uh, and broad, uh, broad trade issues uh, over time. Of course, it's taken on more and more and more. And now we've got it so cluttered that I see federal members putting out, you know, glossy brochures talking about how they fixed a local pothole. That's not actually what we fund our federal leaders to do. The 150 or so of them are meet in Canberra. They're there to set the broad framework within which the country can operate and let other levels of government and the little platoons, if you like, that's what Edmund Burke called them, 
local communities, whether it's a sporting club, whether it's this or the civic engagement or whatever it is, operate within a framework of security and prosperity and do their thing best and meet people's personal needs because we're all relational beings. Government's very impersonal. So the more we can keep our relationships and our own families and communities working, the less need we will probably have, if I can just make this point on the way through, of wanting help from on high, because so often you've alluded to it, that help from on high comes with a temptation to grab more and more power. Oh, you know, and, and it's, you know, the, the, the best as, you know, the the, um, the quote about papal infallibility, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I think it was Lord Acton uh, that, 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 that said that, and it's absolutely true. So you get decent people there who are, are shouldered with responsibility that they they should have resisted the temptation. And you're right, temptation is actually the right word. They should have resisted the temptation uh, to, to give up and to not shoulder but again, that's hard. It comes back to my first question, really. That's hard in a democracy. And and I can actually give an example. Warren Inch was coming through. He's the local, uh, he's the local member. I, I think we served together for a long time. Gonna say, I'm pretty sure you're acquainted with him. He's and larger he than life. He yeah, oh, he's yeah, I, 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 I quite like him actually. Um, but uh don't tell him that. Anyway, uh, you know, the, the relationship we have is kind of like teasing each other a bit. So that's uh, I think that's more healthy and more Australian. Anyway, so uh, I was talking to uh, Warren and a person came up and said, oh, Warren, you know, there's this thing I want to talk to you about, blah, blah, blah. And they started explaining it. And and Warren and and I, I shut up because I was there in my capacity as officer in charge and I was in uniform. The person walked away. I, I won't tell you exactly what it was. And I said, and he goes, oh, you know, I'll get my people on it, blah, 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 blah. I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. And I was like, Warren, that's a state issue. Even if you wanted to act, you can't. The Constitution prevents you from doing it. I said, mate, you... You should have batted that person away. And he turns to me and he kind of like was almost dismissive. And he said, Matt, it's coming up to election time. And when it's coming up to election time, every issue is a federal issue. I can tell you that for no charge. And see, that's the point. So fundamentally, it's about like how, how can in a democracy we can manage the expectation and considering that we have, because there's all these dynamics involved in this, John, you think about it. So first, there's this, all these what's happening with us culturally as Australians, in fact, in the West. There's this concept of an erosion of personal responsibility, that the only reason anyone acts for anything is, is for power. Um, and again, so that's diluting, you know, that's diluting the the real, the actual perspective of how we of how we see things. And it means yeah. that people want to shield, they want to not shoulder responsibility. So if something goes wrong, they can say, well, it wasn't me. Um, and again, so you have to manage that in a democracy where you're seeking office. You have to you have to manage that. Uh, That's you, right. Well, not not even manage it really. You have to you have to a certain degree indulge it. And if you throw it in, because look, I know you're an Old Testament man, as a, you know, uh, sorry, a biblical man, as am I. Um, we remember the story of Exodus, where you have a lot of the people who escaped actual slavery, were well, actual slavery, a proper totalitarian dictatorship, and when things got tough, a lot of them walked heads held high, back to yep. Egypt, you know. And that that part of that narrative is trying to is is trying to tell us something. Like it's not only is it re recording something that actually happened. It's it's telling us it's look. Some people just will not shoulder freedom. They just they don't want it. It's too much of a heavy burden from people will choose slavery, and ease, and comfort. Not that, that there was ease and comfort in Egypt, but like comparative to walking around the desert eating manna and God knows what else they were eating. Now, that's really interesting, that psychological insight. Now, I'm sure your, your insights are absolutely, in my view, Matt, spot on, because you're alluding to a couple of things there. Um, and that's why, of course, uh, you know, I was asked and, and why the, the conference in London focused a little on sub, the subsidiarity, big word. But it is key to rich relationships and freedom. The two go hand in hand, I think. Uh, if you're in solid relationships, you'll defend them. You'll defend your freedoms vigorously. Um, but you've just touched on something. If, you know, if you lose an understanding of that, because that's what's happening. And our attempt in England was to start to push back a little bit. You know, right across the West, we're trying to sort of say, hey, hang on, let's rediscover a little bit of that sense of independence, that sense of responsibility, because we're losing our freedoms because of um, 
uh, we're, we're losing the, that understanding. But it's more than that. As the American, I think it was John Adams said, a people who, who, who prefer security over freedom end up losing both. Yeah. Well, walking, and I think we, we have lost walking, sight of that. Freedom is walking. really important. And to be really honest, you know, I, here's a confession. I, I, in many ways, I, I, I know people have very strong views on how COVID was handled. But one thing I really do worry about as I look back on it is the way in which people too readily surrendered their freedoms in fear. Absolutely. And some state governments were worse than others. I come from New South Wales, where I think it was the biggest state, which I, th I think managed it better than any other state, to be honest. Um, uh, but, but people were too willing to give up their freedoms for security. Absolutely. I also think our media let us down. Oh, yeah. Where was our national broadcaster pointing out that, they, that we had to take into account not just people's survival, but the economic cost and what damage it would do to the economy because that's a moral issue, you know? The decisions we made have come against young Australians. It don't think it's just about numbers. It's not. Mm. It's rebounded badly on younger Australians in an economic sense. Um, and, and thirdly, the mental health issues. Now, all of that should have been spelt out so that people could work out how to make the trade-offs. But, oh, no, 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 it was just if, if we don't have lockdowns, you'll die. It was too simple. It was too dictatorial. It was too patronising because it didn't spell out the difficult choices that we really needed to make, if that makes sense. Oh. So we are surrendering our freedoms, partly, I'm going to be really blunt about this, because we've got lazy and are not engaging in debates about it, the very sort of debate that, Matt, I think you're trying to promote, and good on you. Let me ask, if can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, when you see those, um, you know, you've had experience in remote areas of Queensland, and when I think of far north Queensland, uh, 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 I'll never forget a bloke in Rockhampton. I, I had a couple of fellows from Queensland, they're giving me a hard time. They're calling me a Mexica. You know, you know that south of the border, you've probably heard that expression. <laughs> and there's, there's two blokes in Rockhampton uh, and uh, they're, they're giving me this hard time. And one bloke there, big tall fellow, he wasn't saying anything. He said, ah, he said, he looked at his two queens and he said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, as far as I'm concerned, you're all Mexicans because he came from up your way. And he thought if you were south of Rockhampton, you are a Mexican. <laughs> he came from another country. But we've always had this view of, of, of inland Queenslanders in particular as being rugged individuals uh, who are very self-reliant uh, and almost shun the idea that the government could ever be there to help them. Is that spirit still alive or do you think it's been really badly tapped out as well? No, I I, I don't think it existed much in, in the first place anyway. And, and uh, the foundational narrative of a country goes to shape its character. So if you look at the American, uh, the American narrative, to a certain degree, it's true. And you look at the stories they told themselves in the Westerns and, and, and all that and all that kind of stuff. It's like guy with gun, Bible in one hand, going and building himself, you know, hunting beavers, grizzly atoms, out in the middle of nowhere, that kind of stuff, building a civilization, totally self-reliant. It's not happening because or with the government. It's happening despite the government. And although that's a little bit of an exaggeration, like, you know, uh, it's, by and large, most of the exploration of America was done by those sorts of people, with the obvious exception of the Lewis and Clark expedition, which was government funded. But all the other explorers were guys that just went grabbed a gun and said, you know, I'm going here because I want to trade fur or whatever, it, you know, or whatever it was. But if you think of every Australian exploration, uh, Burke and Wills, you, you, look, if you name any of those famous explorers that we learn of at school, and we're not being taught anymore, incidentally, it's another story, I suppose. But yeah, but an important story. Yeah, important stories. But they're all government function. Everything happened through government. That's how we've acted. And if you think of how we were actually founded. So a, a bunch of convicts uh, turned up here under, under the who were under martial law, the martial law of, of, of the Marines. And by and large, like, I mean, it was, an, it was a dictatorship, but an enlightened, and I mean that in the sense of... Uh, both are philosophical because that's you know the height of the Enlightenment, arguably at, at the time, and men who took that took those principles really, really seriously. 
So it kind of worked. What they did is actually, though, create a create a nation that was functional, but was still always looking to authority and expecting to be licensed. Now, there really right. isn't much action that isn't licensed. Now, if you want to cut down a tree in Australia, if you want to cut down a tree or build a dam in Queensland, I got you know I, I got a lot of mates who who do run properties and and they don't have the the cape doesn't have the carrying capacity for cattle that's um that, that you have down in New South Wales. I think it's like one beast for every five hectares or something ridiculous because you know, the carrying capacity is just rubbish. Um, but they're not allowed to improve their land. It's like they they got to seek a license to build a dam to chop down a tree. And, and I mean talking gidgy trees here. Like I'm not talking about you know beautiful eucalypts and stuff like that in so much as they exist in the Cape because it's different kind of country. It's like this this stuff's you know it's gidgy or you know it's it's acacia even it's it's kind of like imported. But that licensing mentality, you've got to remember, John, that happened. Sure, there's people there that like power, and yeah, it's tempting to blame the bureaucracy, but people asked for it. Like people came to their elected representatives and said, I want you to do this. They walked heads held high back into their dark Egyptian nights, pumping their air, thinking that they'd won a victory. Your insights, I think, are, are valuable. And and you're right. In many ways, we were the sort of product of uh, the height of the Enlightenment, but also the evangelical age out of, out of Great Britain. It, it was a time of enormous ferment. Britain had been a very corrupt country. It really had been in the 17th century. And you had the rise of uh, extraordinary figures in government, in politics, at the top of society, starting to say all sorts of really profound things like we ought to be responsible in India and slavery is a great evil and we ought to get rid of it. And all of that was happening at about the same time Australia was settled. So you had people of genuinely enlightened views. There's no doubt about that. There will be no slaves in the new colony. Um, uh, Middleton, who put together the first fleet, uh, wrote in his diary when he was asked by the Prime Minister, no less. Interesting, he wasn't the head of the Navy, he was number three in the Navy, but the Prime Minister must have been a discerning man, Pitt, and he chose Middleton to go and put the, the, the uh, expedition together, and Middleton went out and got uh, very seaworthy ships. None of them were more than five years old. They all made it. That was rare in those days. No. Uh, he said, uh, this will not be just a penal colony. This will be a place of rehabilitation. And um, uh, the convicts will have the same uh, 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 rations as uh, the uh, the guards. And, right. you know, they weighed more when they arrived in Botany on average than when they'd left England. Yeah. Their health improved on the trip out. Yeah. And there were those upsides, the, the sort of enlightened approach. And I know it's become controversial now, but if you look carefully through those diaries, they genuinely thought, I know this is going to be sensitive, but just go back to their motivations. They genuinely thought they could bring education and enlightenment and, if you like, a better way of life to the people who were here, and they didn't use those patronising terms like sav uh, noble savages. They didn't use those terms. They talked about them as, uh, you know, human beings, fellow human beings, if you look at the, at the literature, at the best amongst those people who wanted to kick all of this off. But then, as you say, you're absolutely right. It was an authoritarian regime. They were convicts. <laughs> and so things were tough. And it has played out. It's very interesting if you stop and think about it. Hancock noticed that the great historian in the 1930s that we were people who prided ourselves on being rugged individuals and yet strangely turned to the government when anything went wrong. That's a long time ago, nearly 100 years ago, he noted that. And there's a few little things. An English friend pointed out this out to me. He said, you Australians, you love laws. You were the first people oh. to, to make um, wearing seatbelts compulsory, the first people to ban smoking effectively, the first to do this, to do that. You love being told what to do. Love it. So we're an interesting crew, frankly, Matt. They they, they love it, and it, and it's all about our relationship with authority. That's never left. I, I, I can tell you, like as a thirty year police veteran working in remote, isolated areas, and and yeah, I, I say that. And when people think coppers, they always think the movies like detectives in big cities or or like uniform cops in big cities. It's really really different experience, like a really different experience running a small community in a remote, isolated place because you really actually, you, you kind of become like, 
not a bad, but again, like you, you, you are a figure of authority like, and you have real authority and people come and throw authority at you. I was at the NADOC celebrations in, um, in, in Cohen uh, and they, they were run there. And it was really funny because this lady got up and said, uh, you know, look, I know we're supposed to, I'm paraphrasing, but I know I've got this correct. We're supposed to look back on the, on the, on the mission years as like really, really bad. And she was actually, she's used the word mission, but it was funny because it was actually, she was raised just after, just after the federal government took over, took over the place and kicked all the missionaries out. Um, so there was still that, I think there was still that reservoir of that kind of like competence and capability there. She goes, look, you know, life was pretty good. Like, yes, we had rations and yes, we had all these sort, sorts of things. And yeah, there was some terrible injustices where, you know, people, you had to seek permission to go and do things. You had to, but like, my life was actually pretty good. Um, and that's something that I'm I'm grateful for. So then there was this discussion about gratefulness. And something that struck me, and, and look, I, the police service, uh, well, it wasn't the Police Service Administration Act because, like, I was sworn in 91. But before that, though, the police had to get permission to get married. So if you were a sworn officer and you intended to get married, you had to go to your inspector and say, oh, sir, like, I want to get married and you had to put in paperwork and, and stuff like that. Now, by the, by the time, so in the late 90s, that kind of like, and the reason that existed was because, you know, back in the day when when coppers were, uh, were coppers were recruited from the working class and, you know, perhaps below, like a lot of these guys were, and they're out in the middle of nowhere, like they're marrying prostitutes. They're marrying, you know, because there's no one else there. So it's like, well, that's not suitable. Do you remember that, you know, you're one of the Queen's men this is what you had to do. And especially with your, you know, your, your Irish people, like kind of like, you know, my, although I'm mixed race, like, you know, culturally I'm Irish Catholic. And you look at what, and a really good example actually is the Kelly family in Victoria, where you had all the Kelly, a lot of the Kellys were married to coppers. Like, because yeah. they were the, they were all these people that were kind of like, you know, these bottom of, bottom of the pile scum that were kind of like mixing together. And the coppers, the coppers were part of that. So there was a reason that that happened. But I also understand, although it wasn't enforced properly, like what would happen was you'd say, oh, hey, look, I'm, I'm going to get married. Uh, you'd put in, you'd just put in a report. You just inform them. Like technically you're asking permission, but like no one was ever going to say no. But you had to invite the local inspector around to have dinner to meet, meet your fiancé. And again, like no, no one, I don't know anyone that, that said no, but that was still there. So this idea that it was only indigenous people, it's just it's just wrong. Like we've always lived, we never really shook off the, and I don't mean this in a bad way, like it's always considered a pejorative. We've lived in a really structured society. It Australians love it. We love it. We love authority. We love we we're used to having Marines, we're used to having the convict classes and the Marines, and above that, the decision makers. That's the way it's been since day dot. And, you know, Indigenous, and you still see that, and you still see that too in, in the way that we, we, we're we dealing with Indigenous people. And it's really funny. Look, I've, I don't know how many meetings I've been to, John. I don't know how many meetings. Like, both here in places like Cairns and Rockhampton, where, where I previously served, where you'd be going to meetings with Indigenous people, and they'd be like, oh, you know, we, again, we want the government to do this. We want the government to that. We want the government. You guys have got to do this. Like one of the one of the meetings that I went to in Cairns when I was officer in charge of cross cultural in the last year or so before I left, um, big group of indigenous people. It was right, it and and the memories of the Northern Territory intervention were relatively fresh. It was still on the media. It was like, oh, what a you know what a what a terrible thing because like although that had finished years ago, like it's kind of it's fresh in the memory of people up here in the north because we're pretty close to the territory. And I said, do you realise that everything you've asked for, sir? is basically you're asking for a Northern Territory style invention, intervention. You're begging for it. Now, if you ask the right person, like I'm just a cop, I don't have the position of authority to do that. I'm not an elected representative. But if you ask enough people with the position of authority hard enough, they'll say, yeah, <laughs> like you'd be really careful what you wish for. So again, it's this, this idea of like, well, you've got to, you've got to provide this stuff for me. And then you throw in the dynamic with Indigenous people. It's like, well, you took off our land and dispossessed us. So, you, we, well, well, we can't. Like, you know, now we're kind of like, you you did this to us. Now you have to Now you have to look after us. 
And again, there's a degree of truth to that. Like, it, I mean, are there distortions and exaggerations? Like, yeah. But did dispossession happen? Yes. Like, were people kind of like, there's only a couple of places where people actually heard it. For most of the places, like if you look at Arakoon and stuff like that, you know, missions were started and people came into them. They weren't herded in the truest sense of the word. But that did happen incidentally in Warrabinda. Like people were herded there. It and it happened in Palm Island. Like that that kind of happened. But again, it's 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 a long history of people who are dependent and who have and an expectation that the government will look after them. And it's not just a Murray thing. No, it's an, sorry, an indigenous person thing. It's like a lot of white people want that too. It's a cultural yeah, thing. You know, it, it is a hard one. You see, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, Noel Pearson and I were obviously on the opposite side of the voice debate, uh, but he, I think, has made some very valuable observations over years, and he talked about sit-down money destroying his people. Totally. Um, and I think there is a lot to be said for that. It's not just his people. I think all of us are destroyed if we have removed from us the responsibility to get up off our backsides and go and do the best we can for ourselves. Interestingly, my wife taught in Kakadu for a while, Kakadu National Park mm. in an Indigenous school. And she said the school wouldn't have functioned if it hadn't been for one of the older ladies who every day would take out the trip carrier and round up the kids and bring them in. Yeah. And she said to my wife one day, she actually verbalised it. She said, you know, everybody's critical now of the mission, she said, but actually in our day, we were taught everything from how to read and write and how to you know, look after your hygiene and pay some attention to what you're eating. And now all that's gone. So we've thrown the floodgates open and said you're free, but we've done it in ways that have made people more dependent than ever. So there's well, a great irony in that. And it comes back to what we're talking about, subsidiarity. Yeah. They're not we free. need to re-educate ourselves They're not on how you balance rights and freedoms uh, rights and responsibilities and how in fact if you throw all the structures out one of the speakers uh, uh, at uh, at arc made uh, the a golfing analogy he said people say freedom is doing whatever you like but if you think of a game of golf if you do whatever you like on the golf course and ignore the rules you won't enjoy the game and the game won't work for you you have to live your life and be free to play golf and enjoy it uh, sorry, live your life in, in, in the same way that you'd play golf, uh, within certain parameters, certain guidelines, certain recognised rules that are there to maximise your enjoyment of and benefit out of the game. And we haven't done that in Australia anymore. And you touched on education. Um, we have a serious crisis in education in Australia. I mean, I don't know what it takes for these state departments, let alone ministers, to sort of say... Everything we're trying, and, and let's throw the, the, the education unions into this, is plainly letting our children down. Shouldn't we have the humility and the honesty to go back to the drawing boards and say plainly, we've got it wrong and we need to have a look at why it worked better once than it does now because we've thrown too much of the baby out with the bathwater. We, we really have in this country. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, Milton Friedman talked about the uh, devastating effects of welfare. You're right. It's, it's, it's not a Murray thing. Like, look at look at what welfare did to the, you know, the north of England. Look at what welfare has done anywhere where it's been, where it's been put in place too much. And I suppose Thomas Sowell was famous for saying that there's no such thing as solutions. There's, the, 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 there's only trade-offs. But um, You made it. Sorry, really interesting point there. I just wanted to sort of really put my own position firmly on the table. And this is the thing I tried to argue right through the voice. Uh, you said it's not just a Murray thing. No, uh, I, my fundamental starting point is that um, human nature is the same everywhere. I, I don't think skin colour has anything to do with it at all. Uh, different cultures have different values and we shouldn't say that all cultures are of equal value. We wouldn't argue that for a moment. I mean, are you really going to say that Hamas's culture is of the same value yeah. uh, as, uh, as Western democratic uh, freedoms um, reflect? Really? You can't. You have to make judgments. But having said that, my immutable position, and this I applied to in, 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 the, view, in the belief that categorization of Australians in the, in the Constitution was a very unwise idea, is that if you like, as Menzies put it, all souls are equal in the eyes of heaven. 
I draw no distinction between the worth of one human being and another. And I think the minute you do, you're denying everything we've learned in the West about a free society. Uh, that is not the same as saying that we're all the same. We're not all the same. And plainly, there are people who have much higher intelligence and better learning than I do, for example. Uh, I would have loved to have been a great batsman. I would have loved to have been a Donald Bradman. I wasn't within a bull's roar of being a great batsman. <laughs> uh, we're not all equal. No. We can't all do everything we'd like to do. On the other hand, you know, maybe there are some sort of skills and, you know, that I have that I can deploy to be useful in other areas. If you like, it's the old biblical analogy of the body, you know, many parts, they all come together to make a whole. We've all got to play our role, but they're not all the same. That's the beautiful thing. I, I'm quite sure. I, I Obviously, your speech accepted, John, uh, but the, the speech I liked most at ARC was Jonathan Peugeot's, where there was this discussion. It's like, okay, the good. What are we talking about here? Massive pink elephant in the room. All of these things, because we've gone away from these fundamental Judeo-Christian values, and I've I've argued this with um, a couple of atheist materialist friends, and they go, you can reason your way to this ridiculous Christian, uh, to this idea that all human beings are of equal value and worth. I said, you may or may not be able to, but like other people are going to rationalise that, that you can't. And the second thing is the reason that's so persuasive and uh, it was so persuasive is because it's a revelation. It's like the creator said, yeah, you guys are all different. I created you that way, but you're all of equal worth. And that's just beyond discussion. It's it's not even, we're not even going to talk about that. Now, the fact that we're moving away from that is bad. But the thing that I find really reassuring about all of these things that are happening, it's manifesting itself in art, but that's just the manifestation of these things that are happening. It's, it's like, hang on, we actually have to reconsider these values like and where they where they came from. Look, and another really good example. I, I wanted to I wanted to raise this with you. Conservatives, and I consider myself generally conservative, are getting some strange bedfellows. Uh, and now boy, I had this excellent conversation, and yes, I'm plugging the <laughs> the podcast and interview, but I'm not just doing it because I, I want people to watch it. And I do. It's because it, it was excellent. I had this fantastic conversation with Kev Hine, who's an FTM trans guy. Uh, and I facilitated a conversation between Kev and Sal Grover. Now she's the excellent lady who's been taken to the federal courts by the ironically named human rights commission. George Orwell would be really happy with the way that they've named, uh, they've been named. Because she started an app, I don't know if you heard about it, but she started a, a female-only app, a, uh, a a a male who believes he's a female and claims to be a, a trans woman wanted to get in this app. Sal looked at the photograph and went, yeah, no, okay, you, you can't uh, kick the person off. That person went to the Human Rights Commission and, uh, of course, the Human Rights Commission are backing the trans person against the, you know, because... They don't know how to balance these. They haven't put a hierarchy to these rights, you know, because they haven't figured this. They haven't figured this stuff out yet. They've they're backing the trans person against Cell. Now it's it's going to go to court. So I facilitated this conversation between Kev and Cell, and they agreed on a lot more than they did. Kev started off as like this really green left, lesbian, feminist, like all that kind of stuff, and it's transitioning into. <laughs> in every sense of the word, uh, in, into a conservative. Now, Sal is this magnificent, incredibly intelligent, wonderful young millennial woman. Um, and again, she's an inner city, tealish, left-leaning, green kind of person. But they're really starting to come to understand these conservative principles. I think we're going to end up with strange bedfellows here, John. And I'd like you to comment on that, like especially around ARC and your political career and stuff like that. Like, are you seeing people, are you seeing people coming around to these concepts? Yes, absolutely. I make several comments. The first is uh, uh, your atheist friends who say you can reason your way to the idea of the equality of all human beings. Um, show me. Who's, yeah. who's managed it? Because yeah. where they usually end up is saying, oh, well, all beings, are, all human beings have a moral sense. That's the difference. So because they have a moral sense, they're unique and they're all valuable. That immediately opens the way, but, oh, some are more moral than others. Yeah, exactly. Which is patently obviously true. Um, so, you, are, you know, without resort to the transcendent, 
the idea, as Menzies put it, that all souls are equal in the eyes of heaven and I can't judge because he cares as much about that one, that soul as mine, whether I'm prime minister or deputy prime minister or, you know, I'm the, you know, you know, the nastiest piece of work in the remote country community doing frightful things. Uh, the, 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 the Christian worldview says that, you know, the almighty cares about both of us equally and wants that person to, who's doing the wrong thing to respond. You know, this is one of the issues I can tell you that the more honest atheists that I've met are really grappling with because they realize it's a central problem. True freedom, true democratic freedom depends upon a basis, a rational, reasonable basis for treating all people as worthy of dignity and not seeking endless divisions, rather seeking the common ground that we have. The the uh, the Solzhenitsyn idea, the dividing line of between good and evil lies not between man and woman or black or white or Baptist or Catholic or, you know, whatever, but somewhere across every human heart. Um, that's being lost. Secondly, uh, are we seeing a shift in the debate? Absolutely. I don't believe the old left-right paradigm works very much anymore. The debate now is between those who believe in, let me put it this way, I suppose, uh, almost the Enlightenment model, uh, it has its failings, but in calm reason, following the evidence, reaching a consensus based on the best hard information available versus those who emote everything and say, we'll just respond to feelings. Hmm. Uh, you know, that's the great divide. And as Jonathan Haidt, now he was at ARC, he, he beamed in, he was too busy to make it in person, but he gave an utterly brilliant talk. So look up Jonathan Haidt, it's spelled H-A-I-D-T. Um, he's a New York academic. Brilliant man. I know him. I've done a couple of conversations with him. Now, he um, he is an atheist, but he said at ARC that uh, we need to realise our children are in serious crisis, and he explains why, and he puts the graphs up. He's probably the world's leading expert on this, but he made the point. This is a very interesting point, a very honest point from somebody who, who doesn't, is not a man of faith, that the the only children who are escaping serious damage from a cultural fallout, particularly accelerated by smartphones, which is playing out very badly for our girls and boys, but in different ways, which is yep. interesting. The boys go online, the girls collapse in their self-confidence because they're constantly compared to others. Neither benefits from true relationships with one another. It's all phone time, not play time. But he made the point that the exceptions are to be found in homes where there's real faith and there's a conservative approach to raising the children. Now, that is an extraordinary and important thing to say. And I should say to you, I have the utmost respect for John Hyde. We don't share our belief system, but I have the hugest admiration for his research and for his sheer honesty. And I do recommend that to you and your listeners. ARC, which stands for Alliance of Responsible Citizens, but capital A, R. C, capital A, capital R, capital C, uh, Jonathan Haidt, children, Google that, should come up. It's it's not a terribly long talk. Uh, and the thing about him is his research is meticulous. Nobody, nobody's undermined his research. And he's been doing it for a long time now. So the, he's a classic example. There are many others. Ayan Hirsi Ali is another. She was yeah. a Muslim, renounced her faith, was declared, uh, you know, subject to a fatwa, or uh, uh, not being able to say the hadith anymore, which uh, hadith is, uh, I think that's the term for it. No, I may have that oh, wrong. Um, yeah. It's anyway, it's the declaration yeah. that there is there is no God but Allah and, Mah and the Muhammad is his prophet. And she couldn't say that anymore. So uh, as I understand it, that made her an atheist in that culture. And she's now said, as I thought long and hard and struggled about this, as I've watched the society that I came to where freedom was everything and people no longer treasure it she said i'm reminded of gk chesterton's advice that when we say we stop believing in god we don't believe in nothing we start to believe in absolutely anything, anything. and that's become we believe in anything now the no, latest no. fad and often it's cognitive dissonance because you'll turn around then and agree with something else that's completely contradictory and it doesn't seem to matter mm. well, well that's not good enough it doesn't work yeah, and we yeah. see that in the mental health issues and the depression and the anxiety and the self-harm in our culture.
of course, it's linked. Yeah, and I unfortunately I know a fair bit about about that working up in the cage because um one of my friends uh, and he's a dead set of friend too actually Alan Clough uh, is an epidemiologist. I say that and people think COVID, but like his the epidemics that he was studying up on the Cape were uh, alcohol and drug use. That's what he was kind of like focusing on, and also suicide. Suicide has been a technical epidemic on Cape York for something like ten years. Like technically, I don't want to sound like Jordan Peterson, but technically. <laughs> an epidemic for like Whoa. you know for years and years and it's yeah. like yeah that's that's why i did my church or fellowship on it because like I, I just watched too many bodies being you think of all the you think of all yeah. the human potential in australia i mean where would we rather live so if if how, how it almost comes back to subsidiarity if you can have a country that structurally gives you this massive freedom uh where 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 you know no one denies that it can be tough for people. It can be. And the cost of living crisis for many years real. But nonetheless, where there's basic support, where you can always get the resources to ensure that you are fed and there's some basic medical health and so forth, that, a lot of people don't have that. Mm. Uh, you know, and, yet, and yet we are amongst the most unhappy people on earth. Mm. Well, we should be asking some hard questions. The annual Legatum Prosperity Index finds that Australians are quite pessimistic about their future. Indonesians next door, you know, uh, there are wealthy Indonesians, but there's probably 150 million who spend 90% of their their yep. diet still, uh, their income still just on food. They're yeah. poor. They register much higher on the optimism and happiness stakes than we do. So we need to do some hard questioning again. And the starting point should be, I can't expect government. I can't expect my local federal member. Uh, I can't expect, uh, you know, uh, this institution or that institution to do it if I'm not prepared to admit that it starts with me and I've got to start to look for real answers and real purpose and real meaning. Um, well, there you go. We've ended up in a deep and um, meaningful. <laughs> well, it's supposed to. That's And that's a lot of a lot of my interviews end up going this way, actually. Like, uh, if <laughs> you this really intelligent sex worker and she... Uh, same kind of thing. We ended up we ended up talking about God and feminism, which was kind of like with it, yeah. But um, the the reason this is happening though, it's because of the dechristianization of of society, and we, and we both know that. I've heard you articulate that on 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 more than one occasion. But I, I had I was discussing it with another um, atheist friend, and he'll he listens, so he's gonna he's gonna recognize himself when when I, when I say this. He's like kind of like. Oh, yeah. So, you know, Christianity is dead. Finally, we've got rid of you idiots. Like, we're pushing you superstitious weirdos out of the out, out of the public sphere. Finally, rationality is going to rule. Finally, all that, you know, no more of your bearded man in the sky. It's over. It's done. And I went, two things with that. First, the most importantly, you're talking to a Christian. Like, so we hold that a Jew executed by the Romans 2,000 years ago spent three days in the tomb, and then there was a massive comeback. So, like, you're talking to a guy saying, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. It's like you're no different than the guys that were dancing around the bottom of the cross going, <laughs> it's all over now. Well, there's a comeback coming, buddy. So, you know, watch this space. There is a comeback coming. When you talk to Christians about death, we know that renewal is just around the corner. So that doesn't frighten me. And secondly, to a certain extent, you're right. You have pushed all of our archaic, weird white colonial values out and where did it get us like yeah you've we've had your little you've had your little social experiment yeah you've had your how's it going experiment. for you yeah how's it going for you well and never is divided never is mistrustful thing. never is miserable our children have never been in greater strife so don't give me the stuff about how we're doing better because we rejected the faith of our forefathers <laughs> Uh, but uh, good on you for bravely pro proclaiming what we believe. And and in the end, there can be no greater question. I mean, uh, if the central figure in history claimed that he was God, and if he claimed that he would rise and the evidence in, in, you know, is there that it, the claim's got to be taken seriously, how can there be anything more important in the end than that? How can there be? What if this isn't all there is, our three score and 10? And frankly, from a personal point of view, and, and, and I know people will say, well, that's all very well for you, your privilege, your this, your that. But actually, I have none. 
my life has not been an easy one. You've known suffering. I have to say to you that I actually look forward very much to things being put right. Uh, I want more. And not more materially. Yeah. I want more. I want real purpose and satisfaction and meaning. I want to know. I want properly restored relationships because, as C.S. Lewis put it, I think that's what I was made for. I read a C.S. Lewis quote last night that I'd never heard of before. He said, When we stop eating, eating good food because it's not there anymore, we make the fatal mistake of gobbling down poison that does us great harm. Mm, yeah. Spot on. Yeah. C.S. C- C- Lewis is the man. But look, if you don't mind diving a little bit um, into that, because I think one of the fundamental differences between Christianity and uh, other religions, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll pick Buddhism, uh, that, because I lived in the outer Mongolia for a little while and I was surrounded by Buddhism over there and got some really good Buddhist friends, started to kind of look into it a bit. So I wouldn't call myself, I'm no by no means an expert, I haven't researched, but I got conversant with some of the basic ideas from the people around me over there and from talking to the monks and whatnot. Fundament, fundamental to Buddhism is this idea that suffering is something to be avoided. It's all about the avoidance of suffering. And, you know, you've got to get off the wheel of karma and all that kind of stuff. That is completely the opposite idea to the Christian uh, idea. And especially, I would say, the more liturgical churches, like, you know, the Catholic and the, and the Orthodox churches, where it's like, no, suffering is to be embraced. Now, you don't go looking for suffering; it'll find you. Like that's that that's not a thing. You know, you don't don't go looking for trouble, but you're going to get suffering in your life. It's going to happen, and if you embrace it and you ask, you ask it, and I mean ask it, like ask the suffering. What's the lesson you're trying to teach me? Uh, it will be revealed. That's that's so so different because so so different from Buddhism, and I don't think it's any coincidence that. Um, among, like in Australia, my understanding is the Hindu religion is actually the fastest growing religion in Australia, and that's just because of emigration. Um, but like when it comes to natural, internal, organic growth, Islam is actually, uh, uh, Islam is doing pretty well, obviously among those other communities, but among whites, uh, and I think it was Bernard Salt that told me this, could be correct, anyway, it d- doesn't matter. It's Buddhism is like really, really growing and really, really popular among that. But all Buddhism is at its heart, John, is it's just a form of atheist humanism. That's it. I mean, there's there's nothing else going there. Like there's no cre- there's no God that created everything. If you think of the, the their idea of creation, that it's our cl- collective consciousness that have created this. Like it's all our consciousnesses together. But then there's no explanation as to where our consciousness came from. So again, that's the I refusing saying, well, I can't look at the I, which is. That you know, Jonathan Peugeot touched on that too, like in in his talk at ARC, because we've now science is such a powerful tool and it's so good. But now we're getting to this idea of like, okay, so we perceive things, we're starting to understand that consciousness is probably an integral part of the universe. So it's a property. Consciousness and information, well, those two things are related. So I'll say information. Information is probably a property of the universe itself. Well, that implies something. And it needs to be interpreted. Well, we've got consciousness. Consciousness is probably a part of the universe itself. That's why that's why I I I, I can see a massive comeback coming. I, I think it's going to take a lot of blood, a lot of pain, and a lot of suffering. But like it's 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 happening. I'm I'm for all of the things that are happening, I really am confident that the West has the capacity, should it want to turn itself around. And it's because of the interaction between reason and faith. We're starting to accept it. So you're getting guys like Jonathan Hyatt and other people, you know, Douglas Murray, the magnificent Douglas Murray, sitting there going, actually, no, what you know, no, that, that there are some things that we just have to accept as axiomatic, you know, before we can even engage in science. So what you're getting there, John, is the right relationship between reason and faith. Fundamentally, <laughs> reason is a handmaid of faith. And once we get that, that. I believe that to be so. Uh, And so I think um, to sort of, uh, if you like, land this boat, uh, my perspective on all this would be to say, if we're wise, 
we will sit down long and hard and join up the dots. Our current state of, if you like, religiosity, because we're all religious, this idea that we're not, yeah. is just nuts. We all are. We all believe in something. We all worship something. Exactly. And our culture has said, find God within, be your own God. So we look in the mirror and see God. Uh, it's not working. We're not up to the task. Uh, it means that our community is smashed, apart from anything else, because if I'm my God, I will lead my life my way, and you need it, you know, don't get in the way of me. Don't challenge my Godhead, if you like. Yeah. Um, so we ought to, I think, be prepared to carefully consider the claims of Christ. And what are those essential claims? Um, you were made for good, made to be in relationship. You broke it by sin. I love you so much that I want to restore you to fellowship with me and with your neighbour, uh, with your creator and me and with your neighbour. Uh, I have redeemed you out of enslavement in the marketplace uh, by taking your rejection of me and your sinfulness and your wrongdoing and your hatred of one another uh, on myself on the cross paid the price all you have to do is believe and trust me that is the message and my my plea as we land uh, this plane uh, our conversation would be to say please consider please please take it seriously and i say that out of a place of deep deep concern i you know i served in public life because i actually really do care about the australian people i, I care very deeply uh, and um I, I'm very saddened by where the nation's going. Well, what's the nation? It's, it's the sum total of the individuals that make it up. We're not traveling very well. We need to stop and reconsider and wonder whether we've not taken the wrong fork in the road. I think, hmm. you know, Anne Hersiali's moved away from her atheism. Yeah. Um, so is um, that's a symbol. Husband, Neil Ferguson's moving away from it. I know. Well, that's because of, that's because he's, you know, married to Ian. You know. Partly, but it's also his understanding, I think, of history, sort of uh, realising the thing we've been talking about, that it's not rational to say we'll be rational. It doesn't work like that. No. Um, and, uh, you know, you can say the same with Douglas Murray. He was a believer as a kid, apparently, and, uh, you know, I guess uh, other issues have gotten away a bit, but I think he's <laughs> he certainly moved away from any hard atheism. Yeah. Yeah. There's The tide is turning. The tide is turning, but... Yeah, you know, a, a mate of mine said to because I, I was driving around um, with, I, I was friends with an, a young evangelical um, policeman, and he was like, um, like he wasn't how would I, I want to articulate this correctly. Obviously, he's in the police, so he like he you know he had the intelligence quote and everything that required for that, but he wasn't particularly articulate, um, and he wasn't like, you know he. He wasn't the most intellectual police officer I've ever met. And there are strangely cer cerebral coppers. There's a lot of them out there, look, deeply cerebral kind of people. And I was complaining one day, going, man, I don't know where this is going. He got really dismissive with me, John. He goes, Matt, stop worrying. It's all over. It's done. And I went, what do you mean? He goes, buddy, it finished on Calvary. The day that, yeah. the day he walked out of the tomb, it's over. This is just a mopping up operation. Like that was Stalingrad and Normandy at the same time. Like we're going to have to mop mop some of this stuff up, but don't worry too much about it. Anyway, look, Good thank moment. you, thank you so much. Um, I've enjoyed it. 